Hello everybody, Music Theory 1, video 16. Today we're going to be talking about chord spacing and motion types. A new approach to talking about some things in music that we haven't really talked about yet, and so let's get right into it. So far, we've talked a lot about pitch in class, and we've talked about it in a very vertical sense, in an up and down sense. If we looked at these four chords and we wanted to discuss them, we would look at the ones that happened at the same time on top of each other and count up the notes and look at the intervals and compare to the key so that we could label them as triad types and with Roman numerals and lead sheet symbols, all these wonderful things, and that would help us understand. But of course, music doesn't just occur up and down in terms of these chords. These chords happen in time and they move from one to another horizontally. And so today we're going to start looking a little bit about how chords move between one another, rather than just looking at isolated chords and the intervals within them. What we're looking at here is four-part voicing of chords. Voicing of chords with four different voices. And this is going to be our sort of default for the way we look at a lot of harmony and the way we practice writing harmony. Four voices gives us a lot of options in terms of what chords we want to spell, and it gives us some liberties in terms of how we want to connect these chords as well. These four parts do correspond with the four common voice types that we use for men and women. The highest voice on the treble clef staff is our soprano voice, a high women's voice. The lower voice on that treble clef staff is the alto voice, or usually a lower women's voice. In our bass clef staff, the higher men's voice, the tenor voice, and the lower men's voice, voice the bass voice. Okay, these, this is how we're going to refer to our four parts, the bass, the tenor, the alto, and the soprano. And this is also how we're going to do a lot of our writing. We're going to write on this grand staff with our treble clef and our bass clef, we're going to write two parts on each staff, and we're going to split our stems outward. So our soprano part has stems up, and our alto part has stems down, our tenor part has stems up, and our bass part has stems down. If we wanted to write in these particular parts, and we will be writing in these particular parts, we want to be careful about the ranges that we use. Our bass voice tends to have a lowest pitch of the E below the bass clef staff, and it tops out at the C above, middle C, C4. Our tenor voice tends to have a lowest pitch of the C below middle C, C3, and its highest pitch is that G above middle C, G4. Our alto voice, its lowest pitch, is, tends to be that G below middle C, and it can go all the way up to the D inside of our treble clef staff, D5. And finally, our soprano voice, whose lowest pitch tends to be middle C, C4, and go up to the G sitting on top of the treble clef staff, that C5. Professional singers' ranges often vary and oftentimes go wider than these, but these are nice conservative ranges that a lot of people can work with. In our part writing, when we are writing music, these are the ranges we're going to want to keep in mind. There are lots of ways we can distribute the pitches of a chord between our four parts. One thing we want to keep in mind as we do this is the spacing between our voices, and there's one primary rule that we tend to follow, which is that we do have no more than an octave between our upper three voices. Okay, No more than an octave, that means, between our tenor and alto, and between our alto and our soprano. If we look at the first chord here, we can see that between our tenor and alto, C to G is a perfect fifth, and that's good, that's, up, that, and that's less than an octave. And if we look at the spacing between our alto and soprano, G to E, a sixth, again, less than an octave. And so this is a well-spaced chord. Notice that I'm not asking about my bass. My bass can sing as low as he wants. I'm not going to really worry about keeping my upper voices close to that. If I look at my second chord here, this is a chord that might look okay to a lot of us, right? A lot of times when students start part writing, they tend to voice their chords like this, with all the voices inside the lines of the staff. But what we see here is that between our tenor and alto, we have too much space. Our tenor is on an A, and our alto is over an octave above that. It's up on the C 
a tenth above. That's too much space between our tenor and alto. It tends to make our harmony sound a bit odd, and so we wouldn't want to use this voicing. Looking at our third voicing, we see our bass and tenor are doubled. Between our tenor and alto, we have exactly an octave, and so that means it's okay. G to G, an octave, that's the maximum amount of space we would want. But between our alto and our soprano, again, we have more than an octave. G all the way up to a B, and, and a B that's a little bit high for most sopranos to sing. Again, the spacing here would be troublesome, and we probably would want to bring our soprano part down. If we look at our final chord, we see, uh, again, we've returned to decent spacing. Between our tenor and our alto, less than an octave, and our alto and soprano, also less than an octave. Bass to tenor is greater than an octave, but that's not a range that we're particularly worried about. We don't mind if we have that wide spacing. We want to get used to this kind of spacing, keeping our tenor and alto, and our alto and soprano, within an octave of one another. It's going to be something that we keep an eye on as we write more chords. Okay, I promised we would talk about moving between chords, and I'm going to stop talking about just individual voicings of chords and talk about motion. When we talk about motion types, what we're doing is comparing the way two different voices move. And we have a couple of different motion types. I'm going to explain how the, we define these different motion types in this video, and we'll talk more about how we use them going forward. First, let's talk about contrary motion. Contrary motion is one of our favorite motion types in Western music. We use it all the time. It lets the voices sound sort of independent of one another. When voices move in opposite directions, we have contrary motion. Here we have two voices in contrary motion. They're in contrary motion because the upper voice in the treble clef staff moves up from G to B, while the bottom voice in the bass clef staff moves down G to D. One voice moved up, one voice moved down. That's contrary motion. Again, contrary motion is a favorite. We love contrary motion. We want to use it all the time, and so it's a great one. Let's look at a couple others. Another commonly found motion type is oblique motion. Oblique motion occurs when we have one voice which moves and one which doesn't move, one which stays the same. In this particular example, we have an upper voice that moves, it moves up from G to B, and we have a lower voice that stays the same, it starts on G and ends on G. It doesn't matter if the voices move up or down, all that matters is that one moves and one doesn't. Again, we're going to call this oblique motion, oblique motion, another common motion type, and one that we see a lot in music. Parallel motion is our next motion type. Both of these voices are moving in the same direction. We have two different motion types to describe when voices move in the same direction. Okay? When voices move the same direction by the same number interval, we call this parallel motion. Here we can see that both of our voices are moving up, and in addition to that, they're both moving up by the same amount. They're both moving up by a third. This is what makes this parallel motion, both voices moving by the same amount in the same direction. Now the fact that one of these is a major third and one of these is a minor third does not change the fact that we're going to call this parallel motion. We're more concerned here about the number interval. We see parallel motion a lot in music, but we see it in very controlled and specific situations. Lots of parallel motion makes our voices sound very similar, makes them sort of lock together if they always move the exact same way. And so there are times when we like to use it, and many, many times when we actually actively try not to use it. We'll talk a lot about parallel motion in the future. Let's look at a different motion type that has our voices moving the same direction. Okay, now we've got a different example here. Again, both of our voices are moving in the same direction. The upper voice moves up and the lower voice moves up. But this is not parallel motion, and that's because the voices are moving by a different number interval. Our top voice is moving up by a third, but our bottom voice is moving up more. It's moving up by a fifth. When our voices move in the same direction by different number intervals, we're going to call this similar motion, similar motion. 
Like parallel motion, it's something that we're going to use carefully in music, and we'll talk more about the specifics of how we're going to use all these in the future. Similar motion though, again another motion, both moving same direction but different from parallel because they're moving by a different interval, a different number interval. Here's our last and in some ways favorite motion type, static motion. When both voices stay the exact same, when nobody moves, we have static motion. Okay? We, this is different from parallel motion. Sometimes we think of this like parallel, but parallel motion means both voices have to go somewhere by the same interval. When they both go nowhere by the same interval, I guess, uh, we call it static motion. Static motion is great, we can repeat things for as long as we want safely, and so uh, we love static motion. When we are writing, we look to see how many times we can repeat notes. That, that tends to make things a little bit easier for us. Here's a quick summary of our motion types. Contrary motion, when voices move in opposite directions. Parallel motion, when voices move in the same direction by the same interval. Similar motion, when voices move in the same direction by a different interval. Oblique motion, when one voice moves and one stays on the same pitch, and static motion, when both voices stay on the same pitch. We're going to want to know these terms and want to be able to look at moving voices and recognize the different motion types. It's going to help us connect our chords in skillful ways. We'll talk more about how to use these in the future, but for now we want to really focus on just understanding what they are and recognizing them when we see them. Motion types are pretty easy to recognize when we just have two parts, but when we look at a fully voiced four-part harmony, two fully voiced four-part harmonies in fact, we can actually see that there's a whole lot of motion types going on between all the different voices here. Let's take a look and see what kind of motion types we can recognize between our different voices, because there's so many different combinations of voices happening here. I'm going to start by looking at motion types with my soprano voice. First I'll compare my soprano and alto. My soprano moves down from E to D, and my alto stays the same G to G. One voice moves and one voice stays the same. That means between the soprano and alto here we have oblique motion. What about soprano and tenor? My soprano moves down from E to D and my tenor moves down from C to B. They're moving in the same direction, and so I have to ask, did they move the same interval? And they did. My soprano moved down a second from E to D. My tenor moved down a second from C to B. That means this is parallel motion between my soprano and tenor. What about soprano and bass? My soprano, again, moving down from E to D, and my bass moving up from C to G. That means we have contrary motion between these outer voices, between my soprano and my bass. Soprano and alto, oblique, soprano tenor, parallel, soprano bass, contrary. What about the motions between my lower voices? What motion types do I have down there? Let's take a look. My alto is on G, and it stays the same on G. If I compare it to my tenor, which starts on C but moves down to B, I can see that one voice stayed the same and one voice moved. That means my alto and my tenor have oblique motion between them. What about alto and bass? Again, alto is staying the same, but bass is moving, moving from C up to G. One voice moves, one voice stays the same. This is again oblique motion. And what about my tenor and my bass? My tenor moves down from C to B and my bass moves up from C to G. Since they're moving in opposite directions, this is contrary motion between my lower voices, between my tenor and my bass. Most voice leadings between chords have a wide range of motion types, and you can see here we have some contrary motion, we have some parallel motion, we have some oblique motion between voices. We're going to want to be looking for all the different kinds of motion types between, our dif between different chords so that we can connect them in ways that are smooth and make the music sound in the way we want it to sound. Good voice leading, skillful handling of motion types is one of the key things to making our music sound easy and natural and clear. 
Wow, that was a lot of stuff today in video 16. We talked about how we're going to be spacing our chords in four parts and those how those different parts are laid out, some of the things they do, some of the ways we like to lay out these chords. And then we talked about moving between chords and how we can describe that motion between different voices in our chords. Okay, important stuff as we move towards the part of the semester where we're going to be writing a lot more music. And the next video, we'll be talking about how we can use these motion types to make our music sound very nice and very lovely. I know you're looking forward to that video. I'm looking forward to that video. In the meantime, thank you for watching. See you guys in class.